What will it take for a smooth Brexit? As government ministers resign, Britain's Prime Minister is accused of being soft on divorce from the EU. But how can Theresa May please everyone and convince EU leaders too? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Britain's Prime Minister Theresa May is defending her plans for Brexit in the face of protest resignations from her governing Conservative Party. Junior ministers, as well as two vice chairs, have stepped down following the resignations of Minister for Brexit David Davis and Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson, who says the dream of Brexit is dying. But May insists that her current position will let the UK leave the EU in a smooth and orderly way. In Brussels, where she attended the NATO summit, she said her Brexit deal will protect jobs and British commitments to Northern Ireland. The Chequers deal is a plan that has been put together. It's been agreed by government. We'll be publishing our white paper this week, uh, which will set out more detail on it. It's there because it delivers on the vote that people gave on Brexit. It that delivers the fact that we will have an end to free movement, that we will have an end to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice in the UK. We won't be spending vast, uh, sending vast contributions to the EU every year. We'll be out of the common agricultural policy, out of the common fisheries policy. We deliver that Brexit and we do it in a way that protects jobs and livelihoods and meets our commitment to Northern Ireland. Well, Britain voted in what was billed at the time as an advisory referendum two years ago to become the first country to leave the European Union. Then Prime Minister David Cameron, who called the referendum, resigned. In March last year, his successor, Theresa May, invoked the European law known as Article 50. The formal mechanism to leave the EU set the wheels in motion after 44 years as an EU member. EU rules gave the British government two years to negotiate the divorce. After months of disagreement within her government, May says she's ready to deliver a Brexit agreement that keeps absolute faith with the people's decision to leave. So let's bring in our guests for today's discussion, both of whom are in London. Jonathan Liss is the Deputy Director of the Business Advisory Group British Influence, and John Johnston is a political reporter at Politics Home. Gentlemen, welcome to you both. Uh, Jonathan Liss, let's start with you. The now former Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson said in his resignation letter that uh, the Brexit dream is dying, suffocated by self-doubt. Is he right? Um, well, dream is the operative word here because it never existed except in his imagination and the imagination of his fellow hardcore Brexiteers. Uh, it was always going to be a case that the Brexit he wanted could never be delivered. You either have uh, a Brexit in accordance with what the EU says, which is uh, the full single market and the full customs union, or uh, you have uh, a, a Brexit which divides the UK single market between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, or you have no deal at all. Uh, there was never any option for cherry picking. Boris Johnson has been living in Kyle Cuckoo land for too long. Not just Boris Johnson, it seems, the Brexiteers um, within the Conservative Party, the governing Conservative Party, appear not to understand that the EU is a rules-based organisation and the UK just can't cherry-pick aspects of membership that it wants to keep and those that it wishes to discard. I mean, that's what's led to all of this infighting, isn't it? Absolutely. It's the kind of exceptionalism that Britain has, you know, still maintains, the UK government has still maintained this ludicrous position that the EU needs us more than we need them. That's what we heard during the referendum campaign in 2016, and it's kind of led the policies of the UK government ever since. It's simply not true. It never has been true, it never will be true. So when the EU said after the referendum, you can't cherry pick the single market, you can't, if you want to end free movement, that means you have to go for a bog standard trade deal, they still mean it now. So when the UK government goes to Chequers and comes up with this deal, uh, which leads to the departure of two cabinet ministers, the EU's response is still, but you're asking for the single market and goods, but not in uh, services, people or capital. Uh, that simply won't wash. John Johnston, um, do the Brexiteers within the Conservative Party have any idea of how the, U, uh, the EU works? Um, or as, as the, uh, the former, uh, the now former uh, minister in charge of exiting the EU, David Davis, implied this week that, that this fudge that we've been seeing within the Conservative Party, this apparent um, uh, complete ignorance about the way that the, the EU works, is a negotiating tactic. And that the, that the, the British government, the Cabinet this week, has done the UK great harm by backing a plan that will lead to a, to a less hard Brexit. 
Yes, well, obviously, the, um, the government have now got this plan that they are going to take to the European Union um, that is already in tatters before we even get there. Um, so it remains to be seen how the EU are going to respond. Uh, there's certainly parts of the Chequers plan that they have looked at that they have already said they would not agree with. Uh, and now we have to wait and see tomorrow when the full detail of the white paper comes out uh, how they will uh, accept it. There's obviously... The problem is that if they um, reject this plan outright, it's going to put Theresa May's position in jeopardy. Uh, and I think the, the view in the European Union at the moment is that she is the only person who can possibly come up with a deal that both sides can pass. Theresa May now has a, a more pragmatic, flexible cabinet with the resignation of uh, David Davison, Davison and, and Boris Johnson. Is her position now safe? Has she seen off any potential leadership challenge and reasserted her authority? Well, the first thing to say is that Theresa May is a very resilient prime minister. She's seen off crises that other uh, leaders would have taken them down. Um, but, no, she's certainly not out of the woods when it comes to a leadership challenge. Uh, we're getting the Brexiteers are drip-feeding resignations in in order to try and force her to change her policy position. But ultimately, if she won't change and bow towards their demands, they will probably make a move against her. Uh, in order to do that, they need to file 48 letters of no confidence in her. Uh, it seems likely that they maybe have those letters ready to go. Um, but what that will then mean is a leadership challenge. And it remains to be seen whether they can convince 50% plus one of their MPs to vote her down. Because if they do that, it still doesn't change the parliamentary math. Uh, and it could trigger a general election in which Jeremy Corbyn could feasibly win, which is certainly something the Brexiteers do not want to happen. All right, so Jonathan List, to what extent is the, is the Cabinet and, and, and uh, the MPs within the governing Conservative Party falling into line behind the Prime Minister simply because it is running scared of the opposition Labour Party? I think that's a very important point, that uh, many of them are sort of uh, clinging to nurse of fear of worse, as they say. Uh, but the point is that even if Theresa May were to be deposed, uh, then the new prime minister would still be in the same weak position that any prime minister would be in at the moment, because the UK has almost no cards to play against the European Union. And so when the EU says, uh, we're not going to accept this Chequers deal, uh, you'll either have the full single market and customs union or, or none of it, except for Northern Ireland, uh, then no prime minister, no matter how strong or charismatic is going to be able to change that position because the EU at the moment has no incentive to, to give Britain what it wants because the EU uh, is its credibility and cohesion are at stake and the EU has all the power at the moment because it knows that the UK cannot settle for no deal, partly because the UK Parliament would never accept that and partly because it's equivalent to national self-immolation. It's simply not a viable option for the government and that means that the UK will concede to pretty much everything the EU wants and it has done in the last year already. All right, so you talked about the Chequers deal, uh, Jonathan. That was the agreement fleshed out last Friday at the Prime Minister's country residence when she got her cabinet together to fresh flesh out a, a, a Brexit ambition that they could all uh, unite uh, behind. As, uh, uh, as John was saying, the details of that deal are due to be published in a white paper on uh, Thursday. Uh, as far as you're concerned, Jonathan, what's wrong with the Chequers deal then? Um, uh, why is it un unworkable? Uh, and uh, what do you make of it as, a, as an opening bid as far as negotiations with the EU are concerned? Well, I think that's very important to say that it is an opening bid. And I think that we do need to recognise that the UK government has come a long way from the unicorn chasing of two years ago when it said it could basically have all the advantages of the single market without any of the responsibilities. So now it's at least saying that, uh, yes, we will be in the single market for goods. If the UK Parliament doesn't accept something, uh, then we'll have, we'll have consequences. But the, the, the Chequers agreement is unworkable for two key reasons. The first one is about Northern Ireland. Uh, it's absolutely clear to anyone who understands the situation in Northern Ireland that Northern Ireland itself must be in a single market for goods and a customs union, importantly. But Theresa May is refusing to accept the idea that we will be in a customs union because she still wants the power to arrange uh, third country trade deals with the US, Australia and so on. 
So we have this really peculiar uh, customs partnership, maximum facilitation, new customs partnership, and all the things which the EU has already rejected. Uh, the bottom line is Northern Ireland has to be in the customs union, otherwise there are customs barriers. And that means that the UK, the whole UK, has to be in the customs union. Otherwise, we'll have customs uh, barriers between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which effectively splits up the UK. So that's one of the reasons why it's unworkable. The other reason why it's unworkable is that it's asking for one of the freedoms of the single market which is the freedom of goods, but not the other three, uh, services, capital and, importantly, people. Free movement of people is such a totemic issue for the EU that they will not allow the UK to get benefits of the single market without having free movement of people. So, John Johnston, why, if, if the Cabinet knows that, it, that it's unworkable, that the EU is going to reject most of the proposals within uh, the, the so-called checkers deal, what, why did the Cabinet back it? Well, the Cabinet backed it because the, they need to try and come up with a position that the Tory party would accept. And at the time when the Chequers deal was finalised, it seemed like Theresa May had been able to ambush her Brexiteer Cabinet members uh, with the hope that their backing of the deal would quell some of the Brexit rebellion on her back benches. But as we've seen with the resignation of uh, David Davis and Boris Johnson, that has not happened. The Brexiteers are now in full revolt. Uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg and other prominent Brexiteers have put down amendments to Monday's trade bill to try and dampen down elements of the Chequers deal. Uh, the whole thing has now fallen apart. But originally, the reason behind it was so they had something they could bring to the EU that was unified, whether the EU were going to reject it or not. They had to have something unified, and now they no longer have that. Uh, what about Boris Johnson's political career? There was a lot of uh, media criticism over the former Foreign Secretary following his resignation, saying that he'd been the worst uh, Foreign Secretary in, in, in British history. Um, is it over for Boris Johnson now? Uh, it certainly appears to be. I mean, the, uh, Boris Johnson being elevated to the Foreign Office, many people saw was just the rise and rise of his career. But in many ways, this stint in the Foreign Office has killed off his chances. Um, again, Boris is Boris, as everyone says. He could bounce back, uh, but it seems very unlikely that he would get the backing of enough of his own MPs uh, in a leadership race to make it into the final ballot to members. If he did, however, there is still the possibility that the Tory membership would back him and he could end up the Prime Minister. Yeah, at, at, you say at the moment he wouldn't get the backing. I mean, he's very popular still with the grassroots supporters of, of, of the Conservative Party. What happens if there is a grassroots rebellion? If if uh, uh, members of, of Parliament are going back to their constituencies uh, and, uh, and getting criticism from, from party members locally, uh, as I said, Boris Johnson very popular with those, those local party members still. Uh, I mean, what, what happens if there is a grassroots rebellion within the Conservative Party, not just in the parliamentary one? Well, certainly that's what some Brexiteer MPs are saying, uh, that they're hearing from their activists. They're refusing to go out and campaign because they are so upset with this, what they perceive as betrayal of the Brexit vote. Uh, but ultimately, it comes down to MPs have got to be the ones who trigger the vote of no confidence in the Prime Minister. And for them, the great risk in doing that is that any new leader would be under immense pressure to call a general election. Uh, and in doing that, they risk Jeremy Corbyn winning. It's very feasible that he could win with the Tory party in such chaos. Uh, and obviously, no Tory MP wants to be the one responsible for bringing Jeremy Corbyn into number 10. Jonathan Liss, what about the much-touted uh, Brexit dividend, the financial windfall that the country would receive as a result of no longer having to pay into the EU? There are those that argue that uh, uh, there simply wouldn't be one, uh, whatever the form of Brexit the UK eventually settles for. But let's just suppose for a moment that the Brexiteers are right, that there would have been some kind of, uh, of dividend. This Chequers deal would surely water down any form of, of dividend if there was to be one, wouldn't it? Absolutely. I mean, certainly the, the financial dividend is a, is a total fallacy. But the one thing uh, the Brexit has really wanted, of course, was these third country trade deals I mentioned. And what the government has just committed itself to is to align itself on agricultural standards. Now, that uh, kills the US trade deal at birth, because the US has been absolutely clear that they will only accept a trade deal with the UK, only push for one, if we uh, adapt our agricultural standards to allow uh, hormone-treated beef, chlorine chicken, etc. That means we can't do that. And also, Australia might well ask for hormone-treated beef as well. Uh, we, we simply won't do that. The government has now admitted that. The government has 
basically said that we're going to be a lobbyist on the single market. So if instead of we were removing ourselves from the room and going outside it to try and influence what happens inside it. Boris Johnson, uh, for all that he's wrong about, was absolutely right in his resignation letter when he pointed out that the UK government has for years been arguing with, with bits of regulations it disagrees with, and now it's accepted that it has to accept them all wholesale without any ability to influence them or vote for them. And so that means that the Brexit that's being presented here by the government is not acceptable to leavers or remainers. It's a Brexit, it's the worst of all worlds. It's, uh, it's, it's dead on arrival. Jonathan, I, I just want to bring in a, a third voice into our discussion, also in London. Nina Schick is the Director of Data and Polling at Rasmussen Global. Welcome to Inside Story, uh, Nina. We were talking uh, before you arrived about uh, Theresa May getting her cabinet together to flesh out a, a Brexit proposal that her cabinet could unite around. Uh, the details due to be published in Thursday's white paper. What chance is there that the European Union will accept those proposals? Well, I think that that is going to be the basis for the conversation of, uh, to start a conversation. Let's not forget that two years after Britain voted to leave the EU, it's taken the cabinet this long to even put to forward a proposal as to what it wants to read the future relationship. Even though we've seen the cabinet implode over this proposal put forward by Theresa May, I think that realistically you have to accept that there will have to be further concessions from the UK when it comes to the EU. But the EU is obviously very well aware of Theresa May's tenuous position at home. Therefore, you know, Theresa May, before she even put her proposal forward, she's been sending her deputies around the EU to make sure that they didn't shoot it down as soon as it was put on the table. But the UK will have to make further concessions to the EU. The EU will see it as a starting point to start the conversation. Nina, after meeting Theresa May in Berlin ahead of the NATO summit, Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel said that it's uh, a good thing that we have proposals on the table. Now, that remark was jumped upon by Brexiteers as a, an encouraging sign, a, even a modest endorsement. Uh, to what extent is, is Germany key in allowing Theresa May to secure this smooth and orderly Brexit that she's promised? Look, it's very interesting that Theresa May had supposedly discussed her proposals with Angela Merkel before she even presented them to the cabinet. Of course, Germany will be key, as will all the other European countries, in order to uh, keep the conversation going. Uh, I think it's really important to distinguish that Germany can't unilaterally make the decisions in the EU. There's uh, 27 member states who the UK is negotiating with. And the people who are going to be doing the negotiating for the EU is, of course, Michel Barnier and the Commission team. So Angela Merkel, I wouldn't go so far as say that you know she saw this as an endorsement. Uh, as her comments were an endorsement. Obviously, Germany's position is going to stay the same. Germany has been adamant throughout the Brexit negotiations that there can be no cherry picking. So that means that the UK can't carve off bits of the single market that it wants while not having to pay for any of its obligations. Germany has been one of the hardest countries in the negotiations. Germany uh, and Angela Merkel supposedly even asked why the UK should have a transition period after Brexit, because um, that is indeed what the UK needs in order to keep the continuity for businesses. So I wouldn't go so far as saying Angela Merkel is endorsing the UK's position. As I already mentioned, the UK will have to make further concessions. But Angela Merkel is very much aware of the difficult uh, domestic politics for Theresa May, and she's keen to keep the negotiations going. Uh, John Johnston, uh, for anyone who doesn't follow the, the, the minutiae of, of, of British politics, uh, with the governing Conservative Party in such disarray, where is the political opposition? Surely with this mess, they should be riding high in, in the opinion polls. And would the opposition Labour Party be any better at, at delivering Brexit than the governing Conservatives? Well, certainly we've seen that the Labour Party have not been able to fully capitalise in the polls uh, in terms of taking over the Conservatives. Um, they have a problem also with Brexit. Their Brexit position is quite ambiguous. For them, I think at the moment, as the opposition, that works well. They're able to allow the Conservative Party to tear itself apart, uh, and they only really have to face up to coming up with a plan for Brexit if the government falls. Uh, obviously, they want to do that, and if that happens, I think the Labour Party are also going to find themselves in trouble uh, when it comes to coming up with a coherent position on uh, Brexit. Jonathan Liss, is, is Brexit inevitable? Uh, can anything now prevent it? A second referendum, perhaps? 
Um, in the events of the last few days have made a no Brexit situation much likelier. Um, we have now three months to go before the final EU summit in October, where this is all meant to be wrapped up and signed off. Now, at the moment, uh, the government's in disarray. Uh, Theresa May has still not accepted that we're going to be in the customs union and the single market, or else the UK is going to be split. So there are an awful lot more concessions from the UK side. And when she makes those concessions, she may well be defenestrated by either one of her wings. So if she uh, advocates splitting up the UK, um, she might be brought down by the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland and a lot of other MPs besides. And if she goes to the full single market and customs option, uh, customs union option, then she might be brought down by the Brexiteers. So she may well uh, not be long for this prime ministerial world. And as the chaos ra ramps up, um, the, the free fall uh, will take place. And inside that void, there could be a real momentum from both sides to change course. And that's the point at which there could be a renewed call for a people's vote to ask the British people, is this really what we want? Nina Schick, um, what do you make of what you heard there? What damage has this infighting within the governing party over Brexit done to Britain's standing in the world? Uh, obviously, it's done a tremendous amount of damage to Britain's standing in the world. Again, let's not forget that it's been two years since Britain voted to leave the European Union. The kind of domestic political turmoil you've since, seen since then, I don't think, has even climaxed. I think there's a lot more on the way. The reason for that, uh, as many European political analysts such as myself have been looking at the complicated relationship between the UK and the EU for the past uh, X amount of years, is that of course this was going to be difficult and a lot of politicians made promises, especially on the Brexit side, which are impossible to deliver. So as Theresa May's government has been slowly mugged by reality, there's been a lot of casualties, shall we say, in the political scene. One of them being Boris Johnson, you know, as foreign secretary. I mean, we just know him as somebody who is prone to gaffes all the time. He certainly didn't do very well for Britain as its chief diplomat on the world. And I think that a lot of people are just looking at Britain um, baffled and wondering what's going on. And as I already mentioned, I think there's a little bit more of that still to come. John Johnston, if you had to put money on it, uh, hard Brexit, soft Brexit, no Brexit. I think at the moment the prospect of a no deal scenario is looming. Uh, we have a deal that will probably not be accepted by Europe and the red lines that Theresa May would have to cross in order to get that deal through will not be accepted uh, in the UK Parliament. So at the moment, I think uh, that the no deal scenario is starting to look a lot more likely. And, and what happens then? Britain crashes out. I can see uh, Jonathan Liss disagree, agreeing with that. Jonathan? Oh, yeah, I think a no deal is, has always been impossible. Um, no deal, we have, to, uh, we have to look at what a no deal actually means. It grounds planes between the UK and the EU. It stops uh, radioisotopes, potentially, from travelling uh, to the, the, the bedsides of radiotherapy patients. It's a total catastrophe. It means a breakdown of the, of the UK economy overnight and uh, a border in, in Ireland, uh, which could uh, resume uh, sort of uh, instability and, and even war in that, in that province. And so it's... it's it's a total disaster and no government could ever advocate that position. And we know that the UK government has been running from it because uh, the UK may have made every concession necessary to the EU over the last year uh, because they are so, so, so scared of a no-deal scenario. And Nino, do you want to chip in there? A very brief answer I need from you, please. Uh, I agree with Jonathan that the no deal scenario is the nuclear option and it's nobody wants to have that, neither the UK nor the EU. Nonetheless, very strange things have been happening uh, in global politics in the past two years. And I wouldn't put it beyond uh, this government uh, to see that there could be a no deal option simply because, let's say, negotiations get completely log jammed because of domestic politics here at home, uh, EU politics on the European stage and global events um, with, you know, what Donald Trump is doing, for example, at the NATO summit this week. So I don't think it's impossible. I don't think it's my base case scenario, but the most disastrous outcome is still very much an option on the table. Uh, uh, Jonathan Liss, um, uh, one last question to you. The Independent, the, the now online newspaper, wondered on Wednesday if, with 100 days to go, the divisions within the UK society uh, within UK society, rather, over uh, Brexit, can ever be healed? Can they? Um, it will be uh, a very, very long process. Um, it's funny, isn't it, when, when a Brexiteers say uh, a new referendum, a people's vote, would be, the, it would be incredibly divisive. 
Brexit is always going to be divisive. Whatever happens from now on is going to divide us. And if it turns out that we do Brexit and the economy uh, disintegrates, people lose their jobs when they're promised prosperity and sovereignty and control, and all of those things go down, um, that is going to be the most divisive uh, event of our generation. OK, um, there we're going to have to leave it. Many thanks indeed uh, to all of you, Jonathan Liss, Nina Schick and John Johnston, all of whom are in London. And thank you too for watching. Don't forget you can see the programme at any time just by going to the website aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us at our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. We'll see you again. Bye for now.